A warm welcome to Diplomatic Channel. I'm Millicent Walker. These are highlights of the program this week. U.S. President Joe Biden seeks to retain the White House, announces re-election bid in 2024 with Vice President Kamala Harris again as his running mate. Plus, uneasy calm in Sudan and violence as world leaders urge warring sides to negotiate for peace in the war-torn country. But before that, let's check other top stories in diplomatic circles. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has warned the catastrophic conflagration in Sudan could engulf the whole region and beyond, urging the warring Sudanese armed forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces to come to the negotiating table and end the violence. Multilateral cooperation is the beating heart of the United Nations. Addressing ambassadors in the Security Council, Antonio Guterres says that hundreds of people have been killed and thousands of others injured since the outbreak of the fighting on April the 15th. Mr. Guterres called on the warring parties to stop combat operations in densely populated areas to allow unhindered humanitarian aid operations, including access to food, water, and other essential supplies and evacuation from the conflict zones. Working with humanitarian organizations on the ground, we are reconfiguring our presence in Sudan to enable us to continue supporting the Sudanese people. Let me be clear, the United Nations is not leaving Sudan. Our commitment is to the Sudanese people in support of their wishes for a peaceful and secure future. We stand with them at this terrible time. I've authorized the temporary relocation both inside and outside Sudan of some United Nations personnel and of families. I call on all Council members to exert maximum leverage with the parties to end the violence, restore order and return to the path of the democratic transition. British Foreign Office says Jales Aliva, its ambassador to Sudan, has been relocated to neighboring Ethiopia after it temporarily closed its embassy in the conflict-driven East African country. He will lead the UK's diplomatic efforts in the region to bring fighting to an end in Sudan. The UK, like other nations, has been evacuating its nationals from Sudan. Estonian Prime Minister Kaja Kallas has signed a joint declaration condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine with President Zelensky during a visit to the northwestern city of Azitomir. Kallas, whose country is a member of NATO and the European Union, supported Kiev's calls for accession to NATO. The joint declaration states that in the context of the NATO Vilnius summit in July, they agreed to work together to establish a path that will bring Ukraine closer to NATO membership and pave way for Ukraine to join NATO as soon as conditions allow. Leaders from European countries surrounding the North Sea have pledged to rapidly scale up offshore wind power generation and turn the North Sea into a green engine in the region to strengthen energy security at a summit in Belgium. Seven European Union countries, including France, Germany and the Netherlands, alongside non-EU countries Norway and Britain, came together to speed up their build-out of wind farms, develop energy islands or connected renewable generation sites at sea, and work on carbon capture and renewable hydrogen projects in the region. The aim is to curb reliance on Russian gas and reduce use of CO2 emitting fossil fuels, which remain dominant. Norway last year became Europe's biggest gas supplier after Russia cut deliveries to European Union following its invasion of Ukraine. Washington has agreed to periodically deploy U.S. nuclear-armed submarines to South Korea and involve SEAL in its nuclear planning operations. In return, South Korea has agreed to not develop its own nuclear weapons. According to U.S. President Joe Biden, the Washington Declaration is expected to strengthen allies' cooperation in deterring a North Korean attack. 
There are concerns on both sides about the nuclear threat posed by North Korea. Pyongyang is said to be developing tactical nuclear weapons that can target South Korea and also refining its long-range weapons that can reach the U.S. mainland. The U.S. already has a treaty obligation to defend South Korea and has previously pledged to use nuclear weapons if necessary. But some South Koreans have started to doubt that commitment and call for the country to pursue its own nuclear program. The South Korean president, Yoon suk Yeol, who was at the White House for a state visit, said the Washington Declaration marks an unprecedented commitment by the United States to enhance defense, deter attacks, and protect U.S. allies. The new agreement is a result of negotiations spanning the course of several months. Violence is continuing in parts of Sudan, despite calls for several ceasefires and clarion calls by world leaders for peace in the country. About two weeks ago, fighting erupted across Khartoum and at other sites in Sudan in a battle between two powerful rival military factions, engulfing the capital in warfare for the first time and raising the risk of a nationwide civil conflict. At the heart of this battle for Sudan are these two men, General Abdul Fattah al-Burhan, head of the army and leader of Sudan's ruling council since 2019, and his deputy on the council, Arasaf Lida, the head of the paramilitary rapid support forces, General Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, commonly known as Hamedti. Initially, the pair worked together. They carried out a coup, relying on one another, but now their battle for supremacy is tearing Sudan apart. Both played key roles in the counterinsurgency against the Furi rebels in the civil war in Sudan's western region that began in 2003. General Borhan rose to control the Sudanese army in Darfur. Hemeti was the commander of one of the army Arab militias, collectively known as the Janjaweed, which the government employed to brutally put down the largely non-Arab Dafuri rebel groups. Tension had been building for months between Sudan's army and the paramilitary rapid support forces, which together toppled the civilian government in October 2021 coup. The friction was brought to the head by an internationally backed plan to launch a new transition with civilian parties. A final deal was due to be signed early in April on the fourth anniversary of the overthrow of long-ruling autocrat Omar al-Bashir in a popular uprising. But that didn't happen. Instead of a deal, violence took center stage. Both sides traded blames for provoking the violence. <laughs> The Sudanese army accused the RSF of illegal mobilization in preceding days as it moved into key strategic sites in Khartoum, trying to seize full power in a plot with Bashir loyalists. After one week of strife that has killed hundreds of people, Hemetu says that he will not negotiate with General al Barhan. This conflict of interest between Sudan's army and the paramilitary group Rapid Support Forces triggered a rush to extract foreign diplomats and citizens from Khartoum to safety. Several countries evacuated their nationals by air, while some went via port Sudan on the Red Sea, about 800 kilometers by road from Khartoum. <laughs> The federal government of Nigeria was not left out. Arrangements were made for the safe evacuation of Nigerian students and diplomats from the troubled country. On Tuesday, April the 25th, following the announcement from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinking, a 72-hour truce was agreed between the Army and the RSF after 48 hours of negotiations. Britain and other countries launched large-scale evacuation of their nationals on military flights from an airfield north of Khartoum. France and Germany said they had each evacuated more than 500 people of various nationalities. Thousands of people, including Sudanese citizens, have fled to Egypt, Chad and South Sudan in the past days despite instability and difficult living conditions there. So there's going to be another crisis that no one has envisioned and no one knows how to deal with it. And I think the international community missed a golden, golden chance when they evacuated the foreign nationals that they could have gotten in some supplies, anything to tide things over. They didn't. So we are left with no security. 
no hope that these two men will actually cease cease all clashes or cease all you know uh, um, fighting, and we have no food security, so we're basically left to fend for ourselves with for, with nothing. The warfare has turned residential areas into war zones, killing over 450 people, wounding over 4,000, and cutting power, water, and food in a nation already reliant on aid. There appears to be a window for peace talks. The challenge, however, is lack of willingness to de-escalate on either side. Unfortunately, the short-term diplomatic focus remains on engaging with what the two generals want at the expense of civilian democratic ambitions, but more importantly, with the wishes of the Sudanese people who are likely to pay for the ambitions of these two men. My colleague Joker Rogers spoke earlier to African affairs analyst Ibrahim Manoba over the conflict in Sudan. It's been two weeks of continuous fighting in Sudan, even with the ceasefire negotiations. Uh, foreign countries have begun evacuating their citizens. What do you make of this whole situation? Well, I, I mean, I, uh, I think it's really unfortunate. Remember in 2019, the people of Sudan uh, went into the streets to demand for uh, change, and they were successful in toppling the dictator uh, Omar al-Bashir, only for the army led by Burhan and Gagalo, the two individuals at long as right now, to take power and throw out the prime minister uh, in 2021, who was supposed to help them lead a transition from military to civilian rule. Uh, so to see that the hard work of Sudanese, uh, for many who sacrifice their life and their lives, and for many who spend their time and resources, uh, who are not Sudanese to help achieve that change in government in 2019. Uh, and to see everything crumble right now, it's really unfortunate, it's disheartening, and you, know, you, only, you can only wish it never happened. The 72-hour truce is the fourth you know, attempt in efforts to stop the fighting. They've all failed. Uh, what's the possibility that this rage could end anytime soon? I mean, let's face the reality. These are two individuals who stop at nothing to get power. Remember, the RSF controlled by uh, Emeti or, or uh, Dagalo, as it's formerly known, uh, is an extension of the army. And both the RSF and the army played critical roles in the Darfur crisis. You know, uh, the former president, Al-Bashir, had been convicted of humanitarian crimes and, to some extent, perpetrating genocide in, in, the, in, in Darfur. But both Dagano and Morhan were two key players in that episode, in Darfur, who started in 2003. And uh, they both successfully, throughout Al-Bashir in 2019, in 2021, throughout the prime minister. And I think of this one as the last dance between the two key powers. Uh, and and it it's, will be really uh, myopic to think that any international calls for uh, the stop of hostilities or sort of sanctions will bring these two individuals to the negotiating table anytime soon. Unfortunately, this may go on for a while and it may take some heavy economic sanctions or blockade uh, to prevent both individuals from exporting gold or whatnot that could uh, force them to the negotiating table. There have been, you know, different postulations about, you know, the consequences of this conflict if it's not stopped. So what are your biggest concerns, especially with the failure of the ceasefire agreements? So my biggest concern, of course, is the humanitarian crisis. Uh, Sudan was already in dire conditions before COVID. Uh, and after COVID, things didn't really change. And we, didn't, we did not achieve great uh, changes uh, during the transition period. And now, this crisis. So the primary concern is humanitarian. There are, there are, there are dire conditions in IDB camps, which are now plunged into much more disaster. So uh, apart from the humanitarian crisis, it's also about stability in the region. Remember, Sudan is the window, one of Africa's window to the Red Sea and to the Middle East generally. And uh, if you consider the economic and military interests at play here, 
then you begin to worry. Uh, first, because we've seen the Wagner Group, which is, of course, an extension of, of the Russian government, uh, according to findings by CNN and the Washington Post, that the Wagner Group have been, you know, clandestinely exporting uh, or, or smuggling gold out of Sudan to fund Russia's uh, military campaign in Ukraine. You also see China's interest in Djibouti, which is just neighbor, a neighbor to Sudan, and of course, they propose military base in Sudan by Russia. So you look at this military interest, and you look at the economic value of Sudan, and you look at the fact that it's an access to the Nile, uh, the Nile River, many others of these factors, you put them into consideration, you see that things may not calm down soon, not because the locals or the Sudanese are not willing to have peace, but because international players have greater interest in having a continued war in Sudan to their own benefit. These international players, you know, are the ones also, well, you know, such as the United Nations uh, have uh, called for both parties to come to the negotiating table. But it appears, you know, there's some sort of power tussle that we are seeing here. I mean, it does. The, uh, I honestly do not see too many stuff that the United Nations can help, uh, too many peace, peace resolution that, you know, the UN can broker here. Uh, because the UN has been active in Sudan for for a long time, and the most it can do is to sanction individuals or uh, give relief material. I think the actual realistic peaceful uh, resolution could be broken by the African Union. And the reason why I say this is because uh, you look at both of these generals; they have uh, greater um, affiliations across across not only the Maghreb or Northern Africa region, but also into the sub-Saharan Africa region. And if you can have the AU tell these two uh, generals that whomever sees power, they will not be welcome into the African Union, that no African country will trade with them, that no African leader will welcome them as brothers, then they may have to think it twice because, I mean, what do you gain uh, by exclusively affiliating yourself with China or Russia as a president or as a general in Sudan and you do not have the support of uh, your primary trade partners, which are your African uh, neighbors. So I think the African Union can play the economic uh, leverage here, but also uh, key powers like the US. We've seen the US uh, broke at least 72 hours ceasefire, and there is already plan on going to extend this ceasefire into a permanent, much more stable uh, seizure of hostilities. I mean, it's, it's yet to be seen how that's going to play out, but unfortunately, I do not think this. Uh, uh, this hostility will end anytime soon just because of the massive international interest uh, going on here. Uh, so, Ibrahim, since, you know, the 2021 coup that ushered in the two military generals at the center, you know, of this dispute, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and his deputy general Hamdan Mohamed uh, Dagalu, that's uh, empty. Uh, do you see the conflict evolving from a relatively straightforward power struggle to a more complex war or a full-blown full war? You know, it, Sudan has been really unfortunate since independence in 1956 to have this kind of uh, power tossu snowballing into civil wars. And you look at its history, and you look at the current dynamics ongoing here, uh, you will hardly conclude that there won't be any um, extension of this into a full-blown civil war. Uh, but again, as I said, it's not because Sudanese want to go into war with one another. It's just because of one, you have two individuals who are so selfish and we see this fight against one another as the ultimate price into, I mean, to becoming the, the leader of Sudan, but also because you have these international players who would, who, I mean, have their own interest uh, in, in this war. So, uh, again, I, I do not see this ending soon, and I think uh, there is less that the you know, Sudanese people could do at this point. I mean, you look at the RSF, this is an army, a, a militia group that consists of over 100,000 uh, infantrymen. Uh, you look at the army, they have tremendous uh, air power and they've been striking civilian uh, holdings or civilian areas claiming that the RSF are hiding under civilian tents. So you have these two parties with you know military support plunging in from Russia and China and they'll stop at nothing to, to keep uh, fighting each other and to see who botch. 
And I don't think either of them will budge anytime soon. It's just unfortunate that this is what the Sudanese people will have to go through yet again after 2019 and 2021. So how confident are you, Ibrahim, that, you know, parties to this conflict will respect uh, the terms of the latest ceasefire? I mean, I don't think they will. I mean, you've, you've seen, you've seen the, the, the last few uh, days how this 72 hour ceasefires have been kind of uh, not uh, sufficiently adhered to. Uh, there have been, you know, reports that while the U.S. Uh, Marines or SEAL team were lift, airlifting Americans out of Sudan, Khartoum, they were gunshot still in the streets. And so, I mean, you look at the individual who brought these two men into power in the first place, Omar al-Bashir. This is a person that doesn't really respect ceasefire. Burhan never respected ceasefires. And also the IRS are very notorious for, for um, going against normal war conventions, as we can point to in the case of Darfur. So I do not have any trust uh, 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 with this with these two generals and their respective army. And it's, it's just so unfortunate that this is the reality. And if you look at how uh, countries like the US, UK, Canada, Germany are uh, pulling out, it, it mm -hmm. tells you that they can see this situation easily degenerating into chaos. Right, Ibrahim, thank you so much for your time on the program and for bringing us uh, more perspective on the situation in Sudan. The United States President Joe Biden has announced he will run for re-election in 2024 and that Vice President Kamala Harris, 58-year-old African-American woman, will once again be his running mate, setting the stage for a potential rematch with Donald Trump. While many cite his age as a major concern, his approval ratings remain negative by a significant margin. But Mr. Biden's hopes of re-election were boosted late last year when his party performed better than expected in the midterm elections. They're going to let the country default on his debt. This debt took over 200 years to accumulate. Mr. Biden, 80, is already the oldest president in U.S. history and most likely to face questions about his age throughout the campaigns. He would be 86 after finishing a second full term, if successful, in 2029. We reward at work, wealth, not work. Mr. Biden has a series of legislative achievements to tout on the campaign trail, including a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill and the marshalling of Western supports for Ukraine since Russia's invasion. Within hours of announcing his candidacy, President Biden addressed union workers in Washington, D.C., where he was greeted with cheers of, let's go, Joe and four more years. Throughout the speech, the president and Democrats underscored what appears to be his slogan for the 2024 campaign. It's time to finish the job. There's more to do, so let's finish the job. They did, that's the God's truth. Folks, thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's Diplomatic Channel this week. You can watch this and other episodes again on our YouTube channel, forward slash channels web, and our channels playlist. I'm Millicent Walker. I'll see you next time. Thank you.